Hi guys, it's Chelsea or BGD Flowers back again with another video. Um, I'm sorry if you can't hear me properly, I decided to film outside today because it's quite cold in Australia and I'm trying to soak up as much of the remaining sunshine as possible. Um, I thought today that I would go over Ainsley's story for you. Um, I said that in my last video, or I think I said in my last video, that my next video would be about Ainsley and her story. And so I present to you Ainsley's story. <laughs> um, so to understand this story, you need to understand Ainsley's ancestors' story. Ainsley's ancestors lived in Ireland hundreds of years ago when there were only really mythical creatures around. There were fairies and trees with spirits and elves and leprechauns and all of that kind of pagan mythological creatures that the Irish believe in. Um, it was the time of fairies and witches and magic. Now humans had developed a unique sense of the world around them and they were able to tap into the world's energy and they were able to connect to the earth and the cycles of the moon and the sun and the stars and in being able to do this they were able to use this to create magic they didn't consider it magic it was just a way of life but they were in a sense witches now these witches were able to see and communicate with fairies which were kind of like the spirits slash guardians of nature at the time um, and these fairies were fierce they were wild and erratic and unpredictable but they had a relationship with witches and they each had a mutual respect for one another until one day the witch trial started and this wasn't something that happened overnight this was something that had been ongoing um, first newcomers came to the town with new belief systems and new religions and then they started accusing people of supernatural powers and being fearful of them and all of a sudden there were witch trials. Now the witches and the fairies knew that they were at risk. They knew that they needed to be careful. The fairies wanted to hide and they did. They hid in plants and trees and animals as dormant spirits and they slept. They, they released themselves of their human or their physical forms I should say and transformed themselves into just their spirits and inhabited plants and animals and the like. And in doing this it kind of became like a dormant like sleeping coma state of being and the witches hid in plain sight they pretended to not be magical or have any connections with nature or fairies or anything like that they gave up their knowledge and their magic to save themselves and their families and over time they lost their knowledge and they lost their magic. However, one young male witch decided that enough was enough. He wasn't going to stand for his family and friends being burned and killed and hunted down and he was definitely not going to stand for the fairies who were losing themselves. They had been dormant for a longer period of time than what they should. And what was happening was the lines between fairy and plant or fairy and animal began to blur so much that the fairies began to be absorbed by the plants because they weren't using their own consciousness to survive. This witch, this young male witch, went to his people and said enough's enough we have to fight back 
he wasn't really met with much enthusiasm. People called him erratic and crazy and it's never going to work, we're not strong enough, there aren't many of us left and it's safer to just stay silent. The young witch then went to the fairies trying to wake them up but he couldn't because humans and witches um, can't wake fairies. But one fairy wasn't really sleeping. She also had the same belief that the humans who were doing this to them shouldn't be able to get away with it. So she didn't really go to sleep. She was kind of just pretending. The witch found this fairy and they teamed up and the fairy woke up the other fairies and she was condemned for jeopardizing her people even though they were already dying regardless of what the humans did. And there was so much fear surrounding these two races that this young witch and this young fairy, they ran off together because they couldn't bear to live in a world where they couldn't be who they are. And they did run off together. And even though they were alone and isolated, they were safe to be who they wanted to be. They were safe to use their magic and they were safe to express how deeply that they cared for one another. And eventually, they had a child. But that had never been done before. A witch and a fairy having a child together, it wasn't heard of. So this fairy's body, this tiny fairy's body, couldn't handle birthing a human child. So, unfortunately, she died in childbirth. This young girl this, the father knew that this young, that, that his young girl, his young baby, couldn't survive on her own. She needed a society, she needed human connections other than him, she needed to develop as, as a mini person, and she wouldn't do that alone. So he took her back to the village, worried and scared and nervous for them both, but he braved it and they went back to the village and they lived out their days there. When the little girl got a little bit older, she started asking questions about who her mother was and why she can see things in the shadows that other people can't and why she was different from everyone around her. And he sat down with her and told her the story of her mother, how she was brave enough to run away with him and continue using their magic and how she died in childbirth. He said that it was of the utmost importance that they keep their story a secret because if they were found out, they would be killed or they would be exiled by their own people because a half witch, half fairy had never been born before. So no one really knew what to do with that information. And if it got out, who knows what would happen. So they did keep it a secret. And as the years went by, mother passed down story to daughter and so on and so forth, until it became simply that, a story. They had been kept in the dark for so long and had kept their magic a secret for so long and they had no one to share it with because witches are all about community right they're all about covens and um, performing magic in groups and and sharing knowledge with one another I don't know if you've ever done any research into paganism and witchcraft but that's what it's all about um, of course you can be a solitary practitioner which is what you call a lone witch doing her own thing but often people who practice witchcraft want to do so in a group so that they can share knowledge and without that connection the knowledge was lost and therefore so was the magic they lost touch with their magic and with their roots and the fairies had long ago been forgotten they had, they had not been heard of since this all started. 
and it had been years and years and years and years down the line. Generation after generation after generation had passed and these stories were nothing more than stories to tell children at bedtime, send them off to bed so that they could dream of maybe magic existing in their lifetime. And it remained that way until Ainsley. Now, Ainsley has a mind of her own. She is not about to do what anyone tells her. And she'd been told her family's history um, and folklore and stories from right from when she was very, very little um, as bedtime stories. But she didn't know that they were her ancestors' stories and she didn't know that there was any truth to them. She thought that they were just made up. And it turned out that her family had written all these stories down, all these encounters with magic and fairies and weird goings on in the family. They had written all of these down in a huge book, a big green leather bound book. And each family member, each generation had written down their stories in this book any encounters with magic, any spells that they'd heard of, anything that they had tried to do, if they'd tried to connect with fairies. And all of these, most of them, are very old because over time it became less about writing down the history and more about telling a story and not actually believing that the story had any truth to it. Ainsley, having been told these stories right from when she was very little, decided as an adult where these stories had long ago been pushed aside as fantasy, she decided to explore her spirituality and she discovered witchcraft, true paganism, true witchcraft. At the same time that she found paganism and witchcraft, her grandmother sent her the family book of stories and folklore. And Ainsley, being the kind of person that she is, where no one can tell her no, and she's very willing to take risks and do whatever she wants, she decided to try out some spells from the book and they end up working. So she decides to explore it a little bit further because surely this isn't the run of the mill almost mundane compared to what she can do, witchcraft. This isn't the kind of witchcraft where you get out crystals and incense and you hush a few words at the moon on full moons. It's not that kind of, I mean it is, it very much is that kind of witchcraft, but there was a little bit more to it. There's a little bit more power there, which she, she doesn't know where that power is coming from. Of course, we all know that it's coming from her fairy blood and her witch blood in her. The all of this magic is in her blood, it's in her DNA. And there's something, apologies for the traffic, there is something called, I think it's called DNA memory, where your body and your DNA will inherit the memories of your parents. So it's kind of like that. Upon doing these spells, it wakes up that gene inside her that's magical. It, it wakes that genetic trait up from its dormant slumber, almost like the fairies. That gene was sleeping inside her unused and her whole family was like that. They had never used magic before, not for years and years and years, not for centuries at least. So when Ainsley decided to use magic, it, it woke up this thing inside her that and she, she already had a natural calling to, to magic and to stories like 
about fairies and, and witches and she already had a natural inkling to those kinds of stories she and she just put it down to being told those types of stories when she was little but she didn't realize that it meant so much more than that it ran so much deeper than that so having all of these things going on and, and the fact that she can do these things and she starts going a little bit power crazy almost she starts being like oh well I've got all of this power and I can do all of this stuff and she doesn't realize that with great power comes great respons responsibility if I can get my words out <laughs> um, it, so in a sense it's the whole with great power comes great responsibility thing she doesn't realize that there are consequences to every action she makes with with every spell it can backfire, it, it can go wrong, she could have uh, done the wrong thing at the wrong time and, and pissed off nature. She, she doesn't really know what she's doing, she's never had anyone to guide her and all she has is this old book of old spells that are kind of not relevant for her time anymore. So she goes out in search of more witches to connect to and she finds a few, she has a few conversations, she picks up a few tips and tricks about how to be an urban witch and then she realises that she has to go deeper. So she goes home to Ireland, she's staying in England, she's studying in a university in England um, and in this time we meet Lyndon who is kind of her ex, kind of not. She kind of cheated on him a little bit but it wasn't really cheating because they were never really dating but it's just a messy relationship and Lyndon's got his own problems. Um, so there's that little story in there as well. Um, so she's got her whole life as a normal 20, early 20s, I think she's about 19, 20. She's got a whole life of, as a 20 year old, right? And she's living her whole life as a 20 year old, a normal girl in the middle of university, doing internships and apprenticeships and working night shifts, trying to get by, trying to make ends meet, trying to make rent. And then on top of that, she has these unexplained powers where she doesn't know where they've come from. She doesn't know why she can do the things that she does. She's kind of panicking and kind of like, wow, this is cool. And she's kind of on a power trip because she's kind of felt a little bit powerless in her situation because of the stuff that's gone on behind the scenes. Like she couldn't afford rent a few weeks. She, she goes out partying. She's a bit of a free spirit. She's got a lot of friends who like she's Lyndon's a bit of a like he likes to drink and he likes to smoke and he's a bit dangerous almost but he's really nerdy and like timid um, but she likes to see him as dangerous even though he's really not and he's kind of like a puppy dog um, so she's got this whole world that she envisions and it's like she's seeing through rose-coloured glasses at the world and making people into things that they aren't and with this power that she now has that she's now discovered that she has it kind of takes that to a whole other level and she doesn't really know what she's doing and she kind of gets herself into a bit of a mess and she's and a few spells have gone wrong and things haven't gone the way she wanted them to so she goes home to grandma and she says grandma this is what's going on, What what's happening? And, she, and her grandma's like, what are you talking about? You're crazy, magic isn't real. And Ainsley's like, yes, I know that magic is not real, but look at what I can do. And her grandmother's like, oh my gosh, you can do magic, you have this power. The stories must not have been stories after all. And she kind of sends Ainsley out on a bit of a adventure to discover more about her family and where they came from and what happened there. So Ainsley goes back to that small village, which is now more of like a normal regular town than a small village. Um, but the forest has been turned into a national park. So the forest that surrounded 
the village where all the fairies lived and are hibernating, it's all still there. So Ainsley goes and decides to go for a walk one day in this forest because she's just arrived, she's staying at like a backpackers because that's all she can afford, um, and she goes for a walk in the forest to clear her head. And in the forest, she manages to somehow connect with, wake up, a fairy. This fairy, which is the Dolceteau Elizabeth, which I mentioned in my previous video, this fairy is weird. She is so strange. She has been so isolated for hundreds of years because fairies don't really die very quickly. They have very long lifespans. So she's been around practically since the start of all of this. Um, and she is dazed half the time. She's on edge. Her two main things that she turned into when she was hibernating and and in spirit form was an evergreen tree and an owl and she's got feathers which grow out of her hair which I'm very excited to make the wig for actually because I have a plan on how I'm going to do that and it should be it should look really cool when I'm done with it but she's got feathers growing out of her head mixed in with stray bits of hair she's got feathers for eyelashes she's like wearing ripped clothes and that can hardly be called clothes, more like vines tied with like just bits of things that she's found in the woods from like campers and whatnot and hikers and bushwalkers and whatnot and she's just wild like she will zone out in the middle of conversation and just stare off into the distance and she will just she's so weird and really not very reliable because she's so dazed all the time but Ainsley resonates with her somehow and brings her along for the ride and because obviously it's another magical creature that she can talk to about what's going on with her so she does talk to her about what's going on and she realizes this is a fairy and she can give me first hand information on what happened and why it is I can do what I can do. So Ainsley asks her questions and gets some vague cryptic answers from this fairy character and along their travels they meet up with another fairy character um, who is the Dolceto Elizabeth's sister which is the one of a kind BJD that I bought off Etsy which I showed in my previous video and I posted a photo of her in on my Instagram which I will link down below um, and so it's her sister well, kind of sister because fairies that's not really how fairy biology works um, but yeah they're pretty much sisters and she her main things that she turned into were the tallest of tallest trees in the forest and mushrooms red capped mushrooms so she has this shock red hair these huge white freckles on her cheeks which i'm very looking forward to adding to her face up um and she's just she's quite tall compared to her sister even though she was mushrooms for a long time she was also very tall trees for a while there so she's her body has been shifted oh forgot to mention when fairies turn into their spirit forms and take the form of plants and animals they tend to pick up characteristics of what they inhabit so if a fairy was only a mouse for a long period of time they would end up quite tiny um, compared to other fairies who maybe turned into huge trees or a mountain who would look quite big compared to tiny little mouse fairies. Um, and I also think it's got something to do with elements as well. So Ainsley 
the first fairy that Ainsley meets, the Dol Chateau Elizabeth, because she's an owl and evergreen trees, I think it's got something to do with air maybe, and with the um, one of a kind BJD that I bought off Etsy, um, the, uh, the first fairy's sister, because she turns into a mushroom and a, like the tallest, biggest trees in the forest, I think that maybe she's got something to do with Earth. Um, but there's also another character who is the iOS Jade Head that I bought off Den of Angels Marketplace, which I mentioned in my previous video. And he's here, by the way, he's finally home, which I'm very excited about. Um, I can't show you him, unfortunately, because I'm not actually at my own house, but um, I will post a photo of him on Instagram and you can go check it out there. He's such a beautiful sculpt. I absolutely love how much detail they put into his face. And I think he will work perfectly for the character that I want him for. But the character that I do want him for is more of like a warlock type character. I haven't really fully fleshed out how he will fit into the story, but I feel like there's a lot of odd goings on. Like, magic is being drained from the world very slowly. Like, the first thing that you notice in the novel is Ainsley's plants dying, and then her spells getting twisted around and warped, and then, um other witches that she talks to having strange accounts of spells just fizzling out or not working or backfiring completely whereas the, they've cast the same spells previously and nothing like that has ever happened um and then the the fairies that Ainsley meets along her travels are sickly and the forest is starting to die and they the fairies that are still in hibernation inside all of the plants and still in spirit form are dying and the fairies that Ainsley meets can't feel their family and friends around them anymore. They can't feel them in the plants and trees around them and it seems like they're the only two fairies left. That isn't necessarily the case but that's what it feels like because their life force is so drained and it turns out that the, res the reason behind this all happening is the iOS Jade Head. The next door neighbours just came outside. I think they're gone. I think we're safe. Um, the iOS Jade Head, who I think I will call Conan. Um, so Conan, he comes from a very prestigious... Um, warlock family and they didn't lose their magic they have known full well that they are witches and warlocks from the dawn of time um but they use their magic a little bit differently they're not very kind they use their magic to put themselves into a position of power and when conan's position is threatened he starts leeching magic from the world he doesn't fully understand that he's doing it at the start of it happening but uh, as time goes on he realizes what he's doing and then he taps into that even more he taps into the magic around him even more and starts sapping at the magic around him and and drawing on all of the magic around him that he possibly can which diminishes everyone else's magic because he's stealing it basically um, and how he's doing this I haven't quite worked out, but he is basically stealing magic from the world around him. And they're back. Um, so that's basically what's happening with him. Um, and it's kind of Ainsley's job, I guess. Well, not job, but if she wants to help her friends and save magic, it's kind of her job to go up against him and say, hey, look, what you're doing is wrong. Um, which she does, because like I said in my last video, she's brave and courageous and she won't take no for an answer. Um, 
and that's all the thoughts that I have about Ainsley's story. So I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks guys. Bye.